So six of England's top football clubs have confirmed they are joining a new European Super League. It sparked a massive backlash from fans, from players, former players, and from politicians, including the Prime Minister. Yeah, it's being seen as a seismic move for European football, but FIFA has previously said it would not recognise such a competition and any players involved might not be allowed to play at a World Cup. We're joined now by a Liverpool legend, I've got to say Villa legend as well, Stan Collymore, a former striker and, of course, football pundit. Uh, Mark Palios, former midfield and chairman of midfielder and chairman of Tranmere Rovers, and Kevin Miles, chief exec of the Footballers Supporters Association. Uh, let's come to you first, Stan. Um, I saw your video overnight. Uh, this is just... I mean, it's a, a slap in the face to football fans, basically, isn't it? It is. Good morning to you. And up the Villa deal and uh, <laughs> Eagles, uh, Pat, um, Susanna. Um, look, uh, I've played for Stafford Rangers in the old conference, South End United in the Championship, Liverpool Football Club, Nottingham Forest and Aston Villa, three former winners of what is now the Champions League. Um, I echo the comments of all football fans when they say they are saddened, disgusted, um, particularly with the gatekeepers, the, the two big ones, Manchester United and Liverpool. I'll be quite frank, Manchester City, Arsenal and Spurs, there is nothing super about them in their recent history other than having money. But Manchester United and Ars Arsenal and Liverpool in particular um, should know better. Um, UEFA, FIFA, the Premier League, La Liga and Serie A today should be saying expunge all of their titles, kick them out, they're not welcome here. Wow. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty strong reaction. Mark Palios, you're chairman of Tranmere Rovers. I mean, why are the top six doing this? At, because they are yeah. risking their place, aren't they, in the domestic league? Yeah, I, um, I was also chief exec of the FA and I really talk it from that perspective. Uh, for me, if you believe that this is not an ill-conceived negotiating tactic, because the, 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 it's, it's no coincidence that UEFA are about to set out their plans for the changes to the Champions League. And as a consequence, this may well be something that says, well, look, this could be the worst position you're going to get if you don't listen to what we have to say. But if it, they must have understood that they get the, the opprobrium that they've got since. I, I think you, what you're actually seeing, and I'm an accountant, I don't like to give melodramatic statements, but we're actually seeing probably what is one of the final battles for the soul of football, because... If you look at it, what's always struck me was that you have um, you have uh, uh, professional football, and you have in a market you have a business will try to kill its competition. Actually, in football, as in most sports, what you try and do is reinvent competition, and that's at the heart of this problem because these guys are basically killing competition. And one last thing I'd say, and it's to touch on what Stan and what everybody else has been saying about this as a, as a feature, and that is that these guys have really forgot that they are standing on, if they ever remember, that they're standing on the sh shoulders of giants. Yes. And they can't just dismiss fans, which are the lifeblood of the game. They're not customers, they're fans, and they're entirely different. Mm. Absolutely Ke right. Well, Kevin Miles, yeah. Chief Executive of the Football Supporters Association, representing the fans. I mean, you know, what are these clubs doing to their fans? Well, they're, they're trampling all over everything that football means to football fans because, I mean, football is at, in Britain and throughout Europe is at the heart of communities. And it's the dream. It's the dream that anybody can make progress to the very highest level. And that is part of what is being taken away here in the name of greed. But the fact that we've got to this point, I think, reflects really badly on the football authorities as well, because this is the, the culmination of a trajectory that we've been on for a while, that the big clubs have been, these six in particular, have been in the business of making money out of football for a long time. And the, this has been building up and it has been approached by the football authorities for a long time now with a policy of appeasement, that every time these big clubs come with something, I mean, um, the idea has been raised that this is a negotiating tactic. Yeah. I don't think this is, is now. This isn't a drill. This is a serious proposition. But the response to these uh, approaches in the past has always been to give the big clubs more money and to create a share. And as a result, for years now we've had in, in football, more and more of the money being accumulated at the top by a handful of big clubs, with the leagues becoming less and less competitive. The last response of the Premier League into a, th a threat like this 
was to give these big six clubs a bigger share of their own broadcast revenues from international broadcast. So there is a fundamental problem here with, with football, that this is just the, the breaking point, if you like, at European level, which has brought everybody's opprobrium to, you know, it's brought the you know, anger and revulsion by everybody. But it just illustrates for me the need to have a proper regulation of the game to make sure that it maintains its part, its role at the heart of communities, at the part of, part of cultural life, but also it remains a competitive sport on which activity and, uh, and dreams are built. Stan, I mean, either way, whether this is a negotiation tool, and I expect it may well be, but what they have proven is that they have the power. These clubs do have the power, whether we like it or not, and... <coughs> What is going to be the best case scenario here? That whatever deal they want for the from the newly formed, reformed UEFA League, they will get most of that deal now. And I don't know what the details of those negotiations are, but that's probably the best case scenario, isn't it? That we just get back to where we were, but they do get a little bit about what they want. The, the idea that those six English clubs could somehow, and I saw this as a debate developing last night as to what the potential ramifications are. If the Premier League and UEFA and FIFA don't kick clubs out, if they don't stop players from playing international football and say, Liverpool, United, Chelsea, Arsenal, Spurs and City, play in the Premier League next season, that's fine, and then go off and play in your own tournament midweek, we could have a situation this time next year where those six clubs finish in the top six uh, positions in English football and seventh to 11th, are playing in a rebranded Champions League. How absurd is that, that you have some clubs that are qualifying for one uh, flavour of European tournament and the top six making huge amounts of money, which will give them yet another uh, competitive advantage, yes. um, will be going off to play in their own tournament on a, on a Wednesday and Thursday. It is absurd. Well so today, organisations need to show teeth mm -hmm. Kick them out now. I mean, Mark Pallios, the, the, the other thing, of course, that, that Stan is referring to is that these big top six clubs will earn a whole load of money from uh, being in this other alternative league, money that they'll then have to boost their own positions, which completely distorts the Premier League. I mean, they'll just entrench their position as the top six forever. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I was saying about how this goes right against the heart of football and the heart of sporting competition. Because at the end of the day, it's just if you look at consumers and they get protected and there's consumer legislation to protect them from the free market. And sport is a special case as well, because you have to reinvent that competition every season. So that's right at the heart of this. But, I, you know, I, I think one of the things that also you see here is, is one of the structural flaws. I agree with everything you, the, your, the, the other guys have said. Um, and that is that uh, they've, they've gone down the route that has been applied in the past of bribery. They've said there'll be more money to be given to the lower leagues, etc., as long as our position's safe and solid at the top of the game. Now, uh, you know, th this is something that's happened throughout the years in terms of what, what you've seen uh, in terms of the, the degradation of the competitions in terms of in terms of who wins at the top and who wins at the bottom. The real issue here for me is that it isn't as so much focus on the top line, you should focus on the bottom line, control the controllables and wages cost. We don't want more money that we just sort of pay out in wages. You know? And so that again is a flawed argument and that's typical okay. of the retaining the, the position as before. Kevin, I need to, you know, it seems like everybody is united on this panel that, you know, we haven't got, this isn't a debate about whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. This is like an agreement that it's a bad thing. So let me just put to you what a couple of fans said to our reporter uh, in one of our reports this morning, which is that, you know, this is another competition. It's another opportunity to see a trophy in the cabinet. You know, you'll see the big teams playing against each other. That's an exciting prospect for fans of those big clubs. Can you see as a fan, if, you know, if you're, a, if you're a top six fan, that there might be benefits to this? Well, frankly, no, because I think it would be a very sterile tournament. You've bought your right into, to get into it on the basis of either your history or your, or your uh, appeal to uh, people who want to make money out of it. You're guaranteed your place. So you've not earned it. 
uh, through your competition performance the, the previous season. It very quickly, I think, becomes a sterile, boring competition where everybody playing the same people all the time. But it's also contributing towards the death of football at so many other levels because it sucks more and more money out of the game into the hands of hedge fund managers and big business billionaires who want to make money out of football at the time when kids are trying to get are getting changed in cars to go and play grassroots football because the facilities have been so deprived of resources. It's ridiculous, uh, the imbalance of wealth that there is in the game generally, but this is going to make it even worse and it's going to make it permanent and put that power and wealth permanently in the hands of a few people trying to suck money out of the game. Oh. And that cannot be in the interest of football fans at any level. Well, we couldn't eke an ounce of positivity <laughs> uh, out of any of you, yeah. but um, thanks very well, much indeed for joining us absolutely. this morning, Mark, Stan and Kevin. Thank you. Uh, we touched on the fans there. I've just had a text here uh, from Aston Villa footballer, a friend of mine, Neil Taylor. And, and just think what footballers who play for these other clubs, not in the top six, what yes. they'll be thinking. He says, just tuned in for the Super League backlash and GMB. I still can't believe it's even a thought. Imagine what these players must be thinking. Think, well, hang on, we, we've got ambitions, we've got hopes, we want to play at the very best. Yeah. Because overnight, got a chance of you're that. taking that away. Yeah. It's despicable. I, it's, what I get, it's that negativity that now is going to be around the game. It'd you be know. interesting to know what the players who yeah. play for the top six yeah. think about it and whether they support it. Yeah.